We want to extend a huge thank you to all of you who generously responded to this fall campaign. We are happy to report that, thanks to your generosity, we exceeded our $50,000 goal. Thank you. We know you rely on this site regularly, and we're grateful that you took the time to let us know what this ministry is worth to you. We are so grateful for all of you who chose to become or to increase your monthly contribution as Working Preacher Sustainers. We truly appreciate your commitment to support this ministry monthly. Thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This week we are uh, at the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost, which will fall on November 6, 2022. Our readings are, first reading is from Job chapter 19, verse 23 to 27a. The semi-continuous first reading will be from Haggai chapter 1, verses 15b through chapter 2, verse 9. The psalm is 17, verses 1 through 9. Our second reading is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 5, and then verse 13 through 17. And our gospel this week is Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 38. Now, if you're looking for the uh, Reformation text, that is uh, going to be a separate link. We've run one from the past so that you can uh, do that if you'd like to do that as well. And I think, now, I think we have an agreement. Oh, All same. All you know, my head, my head was going, you did something wrong there. What did you say? Um, <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. It's all, all, good. It's all saints. Yes, yeah. we've done yeah. a Reformation one, but you, you heard yeah. that last week. But, right. uh, but uh, for uh, this week, if you're looking for all saints, we've run an, an, a no one. Thank you for that, mm -hmm. Caroline. I knew something was wrong in what I said. Okay. But I think we're all in agreement about this week's text, huh? This is the this is a really hard Sunday. I'm just going to put that out there. These are not texts that I'm running to the Bible to reread and find edification and uh, hope and support or whatever uh, whatever I'm going to the Bible for. These are not at the top of the heap. I just have to say. So, however. Here they are. There has to be a worst Sunday in the entire revised common lectionary. Like one of them has to be the worst, and this could be it. This I think might this be is it. Worse yeah. in the sense of just difficulty. Like there's no there's no it's Saturday so night. I'm gonna start working on my sermon at 5 p.m. Saturday no. and bang one out this week. <laughs> so no, and all of them require so some if it's Saturday night and you're listening to our podcast. We're sorry. <laughs> pour some coffee. <laughs> yeah, because this yeah, is gonna be a worker. Good make yeah. a big pot. And in part, we were talking about this before we got started in that there's just quite a bit of background that you have to do, uh, or you have to think about or imagine what, how are you going to include this? And, and is it really worth it to do this kind of background for what the kind of message that you want to be able to bring your people? And so you've got, you know, this sec section from Job, which we plop into Job in the lectionary here, there, here and there. And, you know, what do you do with this, this, this large book? We've got Haggai, which is one of those books I always forget it actually exists in the Bible. So there's that. And then we've got our, it, I think it's our second reading, right? From second Thessalonians and this passage from Luke, which assumes that we know all about Leverett marriage. And if you don't know about Leverett marriage, you look at the commentary, but you go back to Deuteronomy 25, which is God's law uh, it, it, for protection of a, a widow. So if a man dies and he uh, has a brother and there's no heir for the uh, for the widow to be brought into that home or be be taken care of then the brother of the dead guy the guy who died yeah. is obligated by law to bring in the wife uh, whether that be 
uh, whether that be a formal marriage or a, an arranged kind of situation, essentially to carry on the progeny of the dead person, the dead man. So, uh, yeah, that's a lot. To- and and <laughs> it's, a, it's a recognition, as as you, you said, and I don't want folks to miss that in passing, um, that it is caring for the widow. It is consistent with this attentiveness to, um, if this is in this particular culture, this is uh, how a woman's uh, future or present is sustained. And so if the source of her um, um, sustenance is gone, um, she needs someone to make sure that, you know, she's going to have food on the table and a roof over her head. And so this is that kind of attentiveness to the very needs uh, of an of an individual uh, for survival in their context. And that's a lot. That, that's a mouthful to deal with. Now, we don't particularly do that uh, in um, Western uh, contexts, but there are still cultures today uh, around the globe where um, the father or brother's uh, attentiveness to the daughter and sister's livelihood until they are married um, is very well recognized. And um, and so it, it's real foreign to us, um, not so foreign for folks in, in other cultures around the globe. But either way, it takes some attentiveness to be able to say, how am I going to talk about this basic idea of caring for the widows, caring for the needy, caring for those who do not have, excuse me, who do not have, uh, given the way that our social systems are set up. And that's the foreignness of this. It is a different cultural social system that needs attending to. And I think that's something we can gain from this. Um, Not in this exact same way, because this passage speaks of something that we don't practice, but we do have the need to attend to those who the social systems fail to care for. And that makes this a difficult sermon, even if you're not trying to explain the historical Deuteronomy, Deut- 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 laws of Deuteronomy. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's. I think you also need to provide background about who the Sadducees were and why this debate about resurrection was a big deal. and. Mm-hmm the context that Jesus is on their turf in the temple. These are wealthy people. These are powerful people. These are people very well connected to Roman muscle. It's just a lot happening in, in the text. And I think, well, the, the, the preacher in me wants to say, this is the first of four Sundays in a row that are going to take you into eschatology. <laughs> maybe even all of Advent, maybe the other three Sundays of Advent, but certainly the first Sunday of Advent that are all going to make you ask questions about what's the future hold mm-hmm. and how do we talk about that in a meaningful way. The problem, of course, is you can't just say this is a text about resurrection because like we've said, there's all these triggers right. about that's a really different way of understanding marriage compared to how we understand it. The the refrain of died childless as somehow being uh, a problem that has to be fixed raises its own questions. There's so many things in here that people are going to hear, people being married to multiple people at different times in life and what that means for for children and friends and the idea of whose whose spouse will somebody be? And then Jesus saying, that's a dumb question. Nobody's married in the next, you know, that freaks people out who are saying, I want to be reunited with so-and-so. You know, it's just, if you read this text, people are going to, there's all these reasons to panic if you hear this text for all sorts of really good reasons. <laughs> and so the Bible scholar in me wants to keep saying, this is not a text about marriage. <laughs> this is a text about resurrection. But of course, um, I'm sorry, the preacher in me wants to say that the Bible scholar is like, well, good luck with that. You know, you've got to do something. <laughs> There's such yeah. this context, right? So well, I- that's, that's the thing. I mean, it's the other side of that. It, absolutely. This is a gift of God's law, right? Care for the widow. Absolutely. At the same time, she ends up in a relationship and is, and the hope in that is that she is going to carry on the progeny of her dead husband. And so it's, 
it's care, but yet it's patriarchy. <laughs> and so that issue too is, you know, the, 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 the care is certainly there, but it is for the sake of a certain understanding of what marriage is right. and what marriage should produce. And, and the sense of, of if, if the man die, you know, dies childless, then who, how, how is his name going to be carried on into the afterlife? And so uh, the patriarchy is gigantic here. And I don't think we can overlook that as well. But I, I, I do want to, I mean, I don't know if this helps at all, but one thing I would suggest is that if you go in this direction, verse 39 to 40, I, I think you need to add that because then some of the scribes mm -hmm. answered, teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him another question because it, it could be easily, again, that sense of, well, the Sadducees and the bad Sadducees, they don't know what's going on. They don't understand. They don't see who Jesus is. But again, it's an, it's an in invitation into conversation about what does the what does the resurrection mean? Uh, and what, what does the resurrection look like? And maybe that's a, I don't know, maybe that is a good question for preachers to engage right. with their, with their congregations. What do you think about the resurrection? Mm -hmm. What do you believe about it? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, my father uh, just uh, died a little over a month ago. And uh, what are the promises that we hold on to there? What am I, I haven't gotten my head around that, imagining like, who is he with, especially when he's still on my mantle? <laughs> so where, who will he be with? I mean, I think those are really real questions. And maybe it's just an opportunity to talk about the questions. And uh, and yet the promise is that, that we are children of the resurrection, whatever that means, whatever that looks like, and maybe sit in some of that ambiguity. Um, is... I think that's some of the hope. I mean, you know, if you told me you have to preach on this in, in two hours, good luck. I, I would probably spend the first five minutes making jokes about leveret marriage. And just this is a way of saying, I know this is a, this is text raises all sorts of questions and freaks us out and is is tainted by certain patriarchal assumptions, et cetera, et cetera. And just to say, let's not dismiss those, but we're going to talk about them some other day. But then to get into this question of not only is Jesus saying, yes, there is a resurrection, ha ha, Sadducees. I think what he's also saying is resurrected life is not just this life with no end date. Mm -hmm. That he's talking about a different quality of life different quality of relationship, different character of relationship that defies description right now, except to say it's not like what you're used to now. Because so many people, I think, hear eternal life or they hear everlasting life and they think, oh, you know, it'll be the same old stuff. And so just to, and, but then just to stop at that and say, we've reached a cliff of mystery where we really can't walk any further, but we can survey the possibilities that are out there. And then to ask, you know, well, so what? Like, what is that really good news? And what does that mean for us? And even the systems that we devise or that we understand God to have instituted to promote progeny, to promote life, all those even fall short, right? So all of the leveret stuff here, I mean, perhaps there's good news in this for this, this, this hypothetical woman who gets passed along from brother to brother that maybe resurrected life means a different quality of life for that person. And maybe, and maybe oh. this is where, oh, well, I was going to say, maybe this is where Job can help. Well, <laughs> let's do it. I, just, yeah, I let's can't do it. believe I just said that. <laughs> I love it. Uh, before we, we, before we make that turn, uh, I, I, I'd like to put on for us that just as looking at these uh, cultural practices are so foreign to us, and we can make a evaluation of them uh, in some ways being less than ideal. This is a promise that whatever it is we don't yet understand about life eternal, it's going to be even better. So if, if, if you can think of where we fall short today will be just as uh, inconceivable then 
in that reality as our looking back and saying, wow, what a patriarchal society, how unfair. I can't believe these are questions or issues. And yet we, we think we know we're living, we believe we're living in a better time. And yet the promise is an even a better time. And Caroline, I love the adding of verses because then we see that answer caused the sense of, oh, maybe there is good news here. But having said that, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you'll do with Job because uh, that's a great term. Well, I, I I'm curious to know what I'm going to do as well. No, I'm kidding. I actually thought about this. So yeah. I think, but I thought about it more as we were talking. In that, yeah, what does it mean to where you get to this precipice of uh, of ambiguity and you don't and and there aren't answers and there's there we lack a sense of we lack the possibility of, of specificity and particularity of describing what resurrection is. And I think that's one of the hardest things about death yeah. is that we, we want that. We want to know where are they and what, who are they with? And, and the language about uh, somebody dying that, you know, somebody's waiting for you and they're, um, you know, my dad was like, Washington is dog. He's waiting for you. And, you know, and so this is what we say. And, and because it's a way to comfort our unknown. And so that's where I, that's where I think Job, this is the, but, and so what, what is the response in that lack of knowing it's, I know that my redeemer lives. I, uh, and if I were preaching and doing some of the stuff that we're talking now, I would bring that. I know that my redeemer lives and, uh, and then in my flesh, I shall see God and my eyes shall behold and not another. And my heart faints within me. And I would sing, I know that my redeemer lives. That would be the hymn of the day. So <laughs> do Beautiful. and, and say, I, yes, have, I know that my redeemer lives right after the sermon, because at the end, like what, what can we say besides I know that my redeemer lives. I have a friend who, uh, who, if I know that my redeemer lives is not sung on Easter, she is not actually convinced that Jesus is risen from the dead. You know, it's like a really important hymn, but, uh, but maybe that's our response. I know that my redeemer lives and the That's God of I, the living lives. Yeah. To in to in That's, the gospel that's my job. That's my job. Yeah. I find that really helpful. And and there's a book as well where Job is not given many answers, but that's yeah. that's the bit of confidence he has there. And and the context for that in Job is less about eternal life as Jesus is talking about, but more the sense of I have an advocate who's out there. And <laughs> and and one day God will be true to God's word, whatever that looks like. And then the end of Job, of course, we don't get any of the sure and certain answers that he wants, no. but he encounters God and God's, mm -hmm. God reveals God's self to him. Mm -hmm. And I would say vindicates or at least reaffirms some of what Job has been contending throughout the book. So you know, where do you begin with eschatology? You have to begin with the faithfulness of God and the promise that things with God in all of their fullness are so different from how they are now that our institutions fail to adequately even foreshadow what some of those are. In a very awkward move from there to Haggai. <laughs> Is it ever not awkward to move to Haggai? For, for lack of a smooth transition, but there is a sense of um, where it, it's talking about the former glory of the temple and um, we'll get a little bit of this in terms of recognizing that the rebuilt temple um, in all of its splendor uh, is very different than the glory of the first. Uh, and so there are questions that I think that are, are, are left just in that idea, too, because if you pay attention to all the texts about the temple, you realize that the spirit of God never descended on the second temple the way that it did on the first. And so this idea of the kind of jewels and the kind of splendor of the second temple uh, is very different from the glory of the former, uh, 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 of the former temple. 
uh, because it's it's not the fullness of the presence of God uh, that is there. I found Garrett Galvin's commentary on the website really helpful mm -hmm. for this, for mm -hmm. instead of seeing this as a God who's saying all the gold, all the silver, mine, 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 mm -hmm. that it's it's a way of of showing the reflection of the, the, the health of the people or the prosperity, the, the well-being of, of the folks in the nation reflected in the temple, that the temple is in disrepair, the temple is considered not to be important. I'm not sure that's my theology about holy spaces, but, but I get what's going on here in terms of how Haggai is, is speaking a, a criticism that's, that's also a deeply pious criticism. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not an easy text to jump into, so we've just jumped over it. Um, we threw a little something out there. A little something uh, out there. Is, yeah. yeah, and it is, it is, it is a different interpretation uh, of, of looking at the temple than uh, other other um, oh, yeah. other presentations would be. So uh, yeah. I do appreciate the uh, commentary for that as well. So, do we want to add the psalm in here to make another awkward transition? I'm just, I'm being awkward today. I'm going to hold on to that role. <laughs> You're going to have to do it again when we get to Second Thessalonians. So. I know. That's why I said I'm going to hold to that role. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is something here of being heard from God in this, uh, of being able, uh, and maybe it's just uh, uh, a moment I myself am in, uh, and the commentary picks this up in terms of the capacity to be able to just boldly pray, to 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 call out to God, hear me. Um, I actually had a conversation uh, about a week ago um, where someone was basically going through a lot and was describing all that he was going to, but the way that he spoke of God, uh, uh, of how he made complaint to God, was in many ways like this psalm. It was, you know, I'm, I'm going to trust that God is hearing me. I'm going to be bold to tell God to listen to me. I'm going to keep the confidence in God's character. Um, but I'm also going to just say, um, I'm, I'm having a hard time right now. Uh, so... Yeah, and I think I think the psalm is could be a way. Given our the conversation that that we've had so far, could be a way to to give language to the confidence that we have in God. I mean, how do we say I know that my Redeemer lives? It's because it's because our God is a living God, and our God is about life. And and one of the reasons that we that we cry out to God is that we know God has our lives in God's hands and we can trust that. And so, uh, and you do have a couple of lovely images here that the preacher could play off of, uh, you know, guard me as the apple of the eye, uh, hide me in the shadow of your wings. Those are two very comforting, lovely um, images that might uh, that might elicit, you know, a, a sermon, or at least uh, the way in which the way in which we, you know what the way in which God is a God of life and 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 it cares about cares about us. So, yeah. With the uh, uh, if um, we turn to this role of the widow and the protection and care of the widow, um, that's a nice line there too. Um, Mm -hmm. The least of these as the apple of uh, uh, at mm -hmm. the the apple of God's eye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Matt, you want to weigh in, or shall we awkwardly turn on the psalm? Yes. I think I think it, you have both spoken wisdom. <laughs> on the psalm. So that's your invitation to awkwardly turn us to Thessalon. <laughs> exactly. Take us. <laughs> You won't even take that bait, will you? You're going to make me start that as well. Well, it's just, it's uh, it's more eschatology. You it's you more... uh, you can't get to Christmas without eschatology. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Well, this is this is one of the most confusing parts of Second Thessalonians for people who are Second Thessalonians fans. Raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> There's an eschatological enthusiasm afoot in this community, and it's not exactly clear where it came from or what it or what it thinks. And the the answer here of the day of the Lord has not come. First, this lawless one has to come, and this has been sifted together with Revelation and Daniel and other texts and as part of kind of the left behind universe, but which I don't think you need to get into. But it is a reminder, and maybe especially with the Lucan text and with some of the texts we're going to see in the next couple of weeks, it's a reminder that if you think Christian eschatology is confusing today <laughs> with different groups believing a variety of things, the New Testament suggests it was then as well, that nobody, no there are a variety of eschatological expectations, metaphors, timelines, all at play in the New Testament, and it's not neatly aligned. And that's probably the way eschatology always will be. Mm-hmm. I, I think we've made the case that it should be founded on the goodness of God and the mystery that comes with that. I'm not so sure this text tells us a lot about God or the gospel as much as it gives us in, a window into a, a first century community that was... Uh, kind of tearing itself apart because of its 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 eschatology, which is important as a reminder. It's a good scriptural reminder. But well, I would just us, say we're gonna we're gonna talk about we have to talk about the future at some point. In the Sorry, echo, in the echo of uh, the rumors of the resurrection, and then time continuing to pass, and there is no return. Um, the conversation is going to shift. And I think you've you've described that very well in terms of just a recognition that eschatological conversations were confusing and diverse um, early on because the expectation was more immediate. And here we are now, 2000 years later, we've had a lot of different ways that we can answer that question. Um, But my Wesleyan eyes linger on verses 13 and 14 um, because it uses that word of sanctification by the spirit and belief in truth. And a reminder that um, the evidence of who God is, I would say, the evidence of who God is, is God's choosing of us for this salvation that is not our own works, but that is God's sanctifying work in us um, through, through our faith in his grace, to use a little of the Lutheran language there. Um, And therefore, we give witness to this good news. And this good news is that God is faithful. And even if the timeline doesn't fit for us, God is going to fulfill what God has promised. And this is an encouragement for us. Um, I'm just going to read those uh, two verses in that light.